Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, if you haven't met before, my name's Tristan. I'm one of the members of the congregation here at St. George's. Let's pray. Father, please give us ears to listen well to your word to us this morning. Please help us to understand your word and to apply it sensitively to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. In chapter 16, we move into the next major section of 1 Samuel. Over the last two weeks here at St. George's, we've been working our way through chapters 9 to 15, chapters that have to do with the rise and fall, the election and rejection of Israel's first king, Saul. We began with Saul, the young man who went looking for donkeys only to find a kingdom, and we ended with those deeply unsettling words, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king. This week, we turn to the next major character in the book, to David, and to what scholars since Lenhard Horst have called the history of David's rise. That is, the portion of 1 and 2 Samuel that extends from 1 Samuel 16 all the way through to 2 Samuel 5. The sermon's in two parts beginning with Samuel's politically destabilizing covert anointing of David in verses 1 to 13, and concludes with David's introduction into Saul's court in verses 14 to 23. Part one, seeing and choosing. How long will you mourn for Saul? The Lord says to Samuel, since I have rejected him as king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I've chosen one of his sons to be king. If God's words seem a little brusque in translation, they're even more so in the original Hebrew. The verb mitabel, which the NIV translates as mourn, could even be translated as play the mourner, suggesting that Samuel's grief over Saul is somewhat overblown or theatrical. At the very least, God is fingering a wound by drawing attention to Samuel's emotionally intense relationship with Israel's first king. Samuel relates to Saul much as my grandfather actually used to relate to my dad. His love for him amounts to a sort of furious pride and it generates both public outbursts of affection. Do you see the man the Lord has chosen? He asks Israel in chapter 10, there's no one like him among all the people. And then those devastating public confrontations, as we've seen in chapters 13 and 15. Samuel's reaction to the Lord's instruction is striking, given that he's publicly rebuked Saul in the most uncompromising terms in the immediately preceding chapter. How can I go? He asks the Lord. If Saul hears about it, he'll kill me. You get the sense that Samuel's public confrontation with Saul has turned him into something of a pariah, an enemy of the state, an impression only highlighted when Samuel arrives in Bethlehem and the elders tremble at his coming. And Samuel's question is also a bit of a window into the kind of tension experienced by later prophets, such as Elijah and Jeremiah. Impelled by God to speak out against monarchs, privately, wanting nothing so much as to curl up into a ball and wait out the, the storm that their words have provoked. Well, having provided Samuel with a plausible cover story, God has Samuel assemble together Jesse, Jesse's sons, and the elders of Bethlehem for what proves to be the clandestine anointing of Israel's second king. This secret anointing, despite its inherently dramatic possibilities, is actually only a foil to the real action of the passage which takes place entirely within the confines of Samuel's head. It's relatively unusual for a Hebrew narrator to give his readers access to a character's thoughts, but that's just what happens here. Samuel instructs Jesse to have his seven sons walk before him. And at the sight of the eldest, Eliab, Samuel allows himself to be carried away by the man's appearance and height, much as he had been by Saul's, and says to himself, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. God replies, just as he had rejected Saul, so has he rejected Eliah. 
and he grounds his rejection in a compressed statement about divine and human seeing. Ki lo asher yire ha'adam, ki ha'adam yire la enayim, vadonai yire la levav. Now, one option when translating this, as I said, rather compressed saying, is that followed by the NIV. Namely, the Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And this translation puts the accent on the thing that one is looking at. People, just like Samuel in the previous verse, tend to be excessively um, influenced by outward characteristics, such as physical beauty or skill. The Lord, however, focuses his attention on the heart or what is inside a person, their character or disposition. Now, if that's how the, the saying is best translated, then its meaning is as follows. Learn to see as God sees. Don't select your leaders on the basis of their outward appearance or even their obvious abilities. Concentrate rather on those things about a person that only become obvious with time, their character, how they handle disappointment or rebuke, or for that matter, success. Their faithful service, not only when the work is easy, but also when it's hard going and unrewarding. And you could easily broaden the application to cover not just leaders, but anyone and everyone. In a culture like ours that's driven by optics and perception, this saying is urging us to cultivate instead disciplined ways of thinking and acting over time as the raw material from which hopefully over time we pray a godly character will emerge. Still saying with this interpretation for the moment, we could then look at how this maxim finds fulfillment in the life of Jesus. You know, it's a striking fact that the first Christians chose to preserve absolutely nothing about Jesus' physical appearance. And the closest that the Old Testament prophets came to giving such a description states that he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Arguably, becoming Christian has quite a lot to do with looking beneath surfaces. It has to do, for example, with looking at Jesus' crucifixion, outwardly an horrific, violent, disfiguring act and seeing in it, even as it enacts the will of evil men, God the Son's willingness to stand in the place of judgment, freely taking the punishment for the things we do that would otherwise stop us from being able to live as the children of a holy God. So this is a message about learning to look at things the way God looks at them. Another way to translate the passage is to place the accent not on what one sees, but rather on the part of oneself one uses to see. And this comes across really nicely in the translation given by a Jewish critic, Robert Alter, who writes, for man sees with the eyes and God sees with the heart. Now, one could take this as adding up to much the same thing as the more traditional translation. People use their eyes to see what is visible to the eyes, that is the surface of a person. God, however, uses the inside of the heart to discern what is within a person, namely their motives and their character traits. On the other hand, it is worth noting that the Hebrew verb ra'a not only means to see, but it can also mean to choose. And it does so twice in this chapter. And the broader context, of course, is all about selecting or choosing a king. In verse 1, for example, God tells Samuel that he's chosen ra'iti, a son of Jesse, to be king. It's possible then that the writer of 1 Samuel 16 is saying that the reason for God's choice of David ultimately resides not in anything that David possesses, whether superficially or at a deeper level, but rather in the mystery of God's will. Remembering that for ancient Israelites, the heart was sort of metaphorically not so much the seat of emotions, but as the seat of the will. And this translation is going to be attractive to those of us who want to bring how God chooses a king into line with how he chooses in general and specifically how he chooses us. That is in a fundamentally mysterious way, irrespective of anything attractive about ourselves and often despite any number of unattractive character traits. I have to try and put it up here. As Paul wrote in his letter to Titus, but when the kindness and love of God, our saviour appeared, he saved us 
not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. It's also a translation that, let's be honest, is going to be attractive to readers conscious of some of the ugliest sides of David's character as they reveal themselves over the course. So he can't hear us. He's got shingles, the minister. He's standing in. That said, and for what it's worth, I think that the first translation is probably the stronger of the two. And also that in choosing someone to be the ruler of a people, God is not necessarily providing us with a paradigm case of how election works in general. Ultimately, however, what makes our translation dilemma so suggestive is the fact that it picks up on two closely intertwined aspects of 1 and 2 Samuel's artistry. It's naturalistic presentation of human behaviour and character on one hand, and its pervasive sense of God's purposes working themselves out in history on the other. Now, I want you to fix those two features of 1 and 2 Samuel in your minds then, because they're central to everything that's going to happen over the next few weeks. The climax of the first half of the chapter occurs with the arrival of David. Disconcertingly, given God's statement in verse 7, the first thing that the narrator wants to tell us about Israel's future king is how good looking he is. And just as Saul's stature won him Samuel's admiration back in chapter 10, so throughout the course of the next few chapters, we'll see David's beauty win for him first the affection of Saul, and then, to Saul's increasing dismay, the love of his daughter Michal, and the friendship of his son Jonathan. The scene then ends with the spirit of the Lord coming with power upon David, just as he had upon Saul back in chapter 7, 10, and Samuel's departure for Ramah. Part 2, Two Spirits. The spirit's descent on David is followed up swiftly by a switch in focus back to Saul in the first verse of the next scene. Now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. David may have now become the focus of interest for the narrator, but Saul is still very much an abiding presence in the story he's telling. Hebrew narrative is typically expansive and often allows readers to develop alternative interpretations of events or characters and Saul is an excellent case in point. One way to view Saul is as a hapless himbo. Tall, strong, and handsome. Physically, he seems to be everything that you could wish for in a king. Intellectually, however, well, he does best when he's following the suggestions of his subordinates, but whenever he strikes out on his own, he tends to make a mess of things. Another way of viewing Saul, however, is to see in him a tragic hero. And this, for example, is the assessment of my favourite Old Testament scholar, Gerhard von Rad. For von Rad, Saul is pictured in the Bible as the anointed who slipped through Yahweh's hand, the one quitting the stage and yielding to him who is coming. Saul, the God-forsaken, driven from one delusion to the other, desperate and in the end swallowed up in miserable darkness. Right to the end, the stories follow the unhappy king on his way with a deep human sympathy and unfold a tragedy which in its final act rises to solemn grandeur. Never again did Israel give birth to a poetic production which in certain of its features had such close affinity with the spirit of Greek tragedy. Now, that's quite a bleak reading of Saul, but in many ways, I think it's quite a compelling one. Saul never sought out the kingship. He's beautifully and strikingly humble as we first encounter him. He's capable of immense bravery and magnanimity even when given the opportunity to take revenge on his personal enemies. All he suffers from is a tiny little character flaw, which is that he doesn't like to look stupid in front of people. And that tiny little character flaw is what's going to eventually make everything unravel and destroy him. And it's that reading of Saul's character that I want you to bear in mind as we enter into this second, more melancholy half of Saul's career. With the spirit having come upon David in force, Saul, bereft of the spirit, now finds himself at the mercy of a roi ra'a Adonai, me'et Adonai, an evil spirit from the Lord. Saul experiences the evil spirit as a source of torment, 
while his servants are in agreement with the narrator that it is God who has visited the spirit upon him. The evil spirit is also incapacitating. Saul here is heavily dependent upon his servants and their suggestions, much as he was upon his father's servant back in chapter 9, prior to his first encounter with Samuel. Saul's affliction with the evil spirit is, ironically, the catalyst for David's entry into Saul's court. With all the swiftness one expects of Hebrew narrative, Saul finds his own successor installed in his own court, himself reliant upon one field with the very same spirit whose departure has left him a prey to the tormenting and disabling, albeit intermittent, influence of the evil spirit. There are several questions that modern readers are likely to have in response to this passage. I had quite a few, but here are just two that came to mind. Firstly, some of you will be wondering, everyone in this passage is totally comfortable with the idea of God sending an evil spirit to torment someone, but how is this consistent with the Bible's portrait of God being perfectly good and for doing evil? And secondly, others of you may be thinking, well, I've never encountered an evil spirit in my life, but what Saul is suffering does look quite similar to some of the things that I've seen in others and had described to me as a form of mental illness. Can I think of Saul as being psychologically unwell? And is that a good way of handling this passage? I'm going to take those two problems in reverse order. Well, for what it's worth, these are some of the things that I think are relevant when thinking through whether or not it's a desirable thing to correlate spirit possession as described in the Bible with mental illness as it's experienced in our culture today. Firstly, I do think it's worth acknowledging that there's significant overlap with regard to the symptoms experienced by friends who suffer mental illness and some of the behaviours exhibited by people described as spirit-possessed in the Bible. Saul's black, depressive moods with periodic outbursts of violent paranoia are things that some of us will have experienced, either for ourselves or in someone we're close to. And secondly, many of the social ramifications of biblical spirit possession have clear analogues in many people's experience of living with a mental illness, although there is, of course, a huge variety in the way that mental illness is treated and regarded socially in our culture. Nonetheless, neatly mapping the one onto the other creates, in my view, more problems than it solves. Jesus explicitly teaches that those who have the Holy Spirit have nothing to fear from spirit possession. And it's just a logical consequence of redescribing spirit possession as mental illness that many people currently experiencing mental illness may come to question whether they do in fact have the spirit. Now, Christians, of course, are no less likely to suffer from a mental illness than their neighbours are, just as they're no less likely to experience a physical illness. But... Christians can have confidence that the Spirit will help them to endure mental illness in the same way that he promises to help us in all forms of suffering. It's simpler and theologically preferable to think of evil spirits and mental illness as distinct things, even though both attack the mind, sometimes in strikingly similar ways. To summarise it, David is not a music therapist, he's a music exorcist. The first question I raised is, of course, much more difficult to answer, and it's a problem that's of central importance to 1 and 2 Samuel, as it is to much of the Bible more broadly. At a systematic level, it's worth stating the obvious, which is that the problem of evil is intellectually, as opposed to experientially, a problem only for people who believe in one God who's both all-powerful and all-good. It's not a problem that arises intellectually for polytheists. It's not an issue for atheists. It's a problem for Christians. Now, all good Christian biblical thinking about this problem will have to honour particular passages in the Bible. On the one hand, Christians will want to take with perfect seriousness John's statement that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. But they'll also want to take seriously the Bible's claim that nothing that takes place occurs without the foreknowledge and permission of God. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God, God says in the book of Isaiah. I form the light, and I create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. All distinctively Christian thinking about the problem of evil needs to hold on to both of these statements without collapsing them into contradiction, 
or surrendering either of them in the process. Thinking now at the level of the passage itself, the servants are perfectly right when they say that it's the Lord who sent the evil spirit who torments Saul. But neither the servants nor the narrator tell us why God has sent him. In narrative terms, the advent of the evil spirit is the issue that allows the narrator to bring David to the attention of Saul. Positively, the result, of course, is to allow David entrance into the court and thus to provide him with all the sorts of experiences and opportunities and environment that will enable him to develop the skills necessary to lead Israel. It also allows for a man empowered with the Holy Spirit to shoulder increasing responsibility in a state at a time when its current leader has shown himself to be more concerned with how he appears before others than with how he looks before God. And we could even surmise that God is punishing Saul for his hubris in failing to carry out his instructions in the previous chapter. But none of this is actually stated in the narrative, just as we in our own lives, generally have no firm knowledge of why we suffer the things we do. But we do live in a world where nothing is ultimately outside the control of our loving and wise God, who orders all things for our good, a world in which God's spirit brings us relief and intercedes for us in accordance with God's will. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would help us to see people as you see them. Help us to make important decisions on the basis of what's actually important to you, as opposed to things that are merely superficial. We also thank you for choosing us, not because of anything we've done, but because of your great kindness and mercy. Thank you for sending us your spirit to comfort us and to empower us to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen.